Imperium, the Philosophy of History and Politics, Chapter 3, The Relativity of History. History must always have its subjective aspect and its objective aspect. But the determining thing is always neither the one nor the other, but simply the relationship between the two. Each of the first two aspects can be arbitrary, but the relationship is not arbitrary, but is the expression of the spirit of the age, and is therefore true, historically speaking. Each of the eight high cultures which passed in brilliant review before us had its own relationship to history generally, and this relationship developed in a certain direction through the life course of the culture. It is only necessary to mention the classical in this connection. Tacitus, Plutarch, Livy, Suetonius were regarded as historical thinkers by the Romans. To us, they are simply storytellers, totally lacking in the historical sense. This could not be a reflection on them, but only tells us something about ourselves. Our view of history is as intense, fierce, probing, and extensive as the whole cast of our Western soul generally. If there were ten millennia of history instead of five, we would find it necessary to orient ourselves to the whole ten instead of to the mere five. Not only are the cultures differentiated from one another also in their historical sense, but also the various ages within the culture's development are so distinguished. Although all tendencies exist in all ages, it is nevertheless correct to say that one certain life tendency dominates any one age. Thus, in all cultures, the religious feeling is uppermost in the first great life phase, lasting some five centuries, and is then superseded by the critical spirituality, lasting somewhat less long, to be succeeded by the historical outlook, which gradually merges again into the final rebirth of religion. The three life tendencies are, successively, sacred, profane, and skeptical. They parallel the political phases of feudalism, corresponding to religion, absolute state and democracy, corresponding to early and late critical philosophy, and resurgence of authority in Caesarism, the counterparts of skepsis and rebirth of religion. The intracultural development of the idea of science, or natural philosophy, is from theology through, in succession, physical sciences and biology, to pure, untheoretical, nature manipulation, the scientific counterpart of skepsis and resurgent authority. The age which succeeds to the age of democracy can only see its predecessors under their purely historical aspect. This is the only way it can feel itself as related to them. This too, however, as will be apparent, has its imperative side. Culture man is always a unity, and the mere fact that one life tendency is uppermost cannot destroy this organic unity. In all ages, the individuals therein are separated from one another, also by their varying development of the historical sense. Think of the different historical horizon of Frederick II and one of his Sicilian courtiers, of Caesar Borgia and one of his captains, of Napoleon and Nelson, of Mussolini and his assassin. A political unit in the custody of a man with no historical horizon, an opportunist, must pay with its wasted blood for his lack. Just as the Western culture has the most intensely historic soul, so does it develop men with the greatest historical sense. It is a culture which has always been conscious of its own history. At each turning point, there were many who knew the significance of the moment. Both sides, in any Western opposition, have felt themselves as clothed with and determining the future. Therefore, Western men have been under the necessity of having a history picture in which to think and act. The fact that the culture was continually changing meant that history was continually changing. History is the continuous reinterpretation of the past. History is thus continually true because, in each age, the ruling historical outlook and values are the expression of the proper soul. The alternatives for history are not true or false, but effective or ineffective. Truth in the religio-philosophical mathematical sense, meaning timelessly, eternally valid, dissociated from the conditions of life, does not pertain to history. History that is true is history that is effective in the minds of significant men. The highly refined historical sense is the characteristic of two groups, history writers and history makers. Between these two groups also there is an order of rank. History writing has the task of setting forth for the age its necessary picture of the past. This picture, clear and articulate, then becomes effective in the thoughts and actions of the leading history makers of the age. This age, like others, has its own appropriate history picture, and it cannot choose one of a number of pictures. The determining thing in our outlook on history is the spirit of our age. 
Ours is an external, factual, skeptical, historical age. It is not moved by great religious or critical feelings. That which to our cultural forebears was the object of joy, sorrow, passion, necessity, is to us the object of respect and knowledge. The center of gravity of our age is in politics. Pure historical thinking is the close relative of political thinking. Historical thinking always seeks to know what was, and not to prove something. Political thinking has the first task of ascertaining the facts and the possibilities, and then of changing them through action. Both are undissociated realism. Neither begins with a program which it desires to prove. Ours is the first age in Western history in which an absolute submission to facts has triumphed over all other spiritual attitudes. It is the natural corollary of a historical age when critical methods have exhausted their possibilities. In the realm of thought, historical thinking triumphs. In the realm of action, politics occupies the center of the stage. We follow the facts no matter where they lead, even though we must give up dearly cherished schemes, ideologies, soul fancies, prejudices. Previous ages in Western history formed their history to fit their souls. We do the same, but our view has no precedent ethical or critical equipment in it. On the contrary, our ethical imperative is derived from our historical outlook, and not vice versa. Our outlook on history is no more arbitrary than that of any other age of the West. It is compulsory for us. Each man will have this outlook, and his level of significance will depend on the focus in these matters which he can attain and hold. Insofar as a man is an effective representative of this time, he has this particular history picture and no other. It is not a question of whether he should have it. So to read is completely to misunderstand. He will have it, in his feelings and unconscious valuation of events, even if not in his articulate, verbal ideas.